slide. Um, but the first thing is um, tomorrow night um, on Wednesday, not whatever day that is. Um, I got this from somebody else and they had a typo. So on Wednesday, uh, there is a data visualization talk, um, which might be really interesting for you. Uh, and it's in the spark space on the second floor of CES. Um, so you should think about checking it out. Uh, how many people here are data science majors? Okay, so just remember there's an election uh, and you should vote. Um, I presume it's open to data science majors. I don't know about minors. Anybody have any idea? I have no idea. But uh, they asked me to uh, to pitch this and just let you know that uh, the election is, is going on and you should go and vote. Um, Project 2 has been released today. Um, and it should be there like right this second and the grade scope should have just opened. It has two checkpoints, unlike the last one, uh, which only had one. So this has two checkpoints. Those are the deadlines. They are also in the syllabus. However, oh, I didn't fix it here. Um, in the syllabus and here, um, but correct in the grade scope and in the actual project, the first checkpoint is actually due to April 7th. It's a Friday, and I put in the Thursday by accident. So uh, it's a Friday of that week, which I think is next week, maybe? Rings it off? I don't know. I don't even know what day it is there. Um, so that's uh, so just a typo here. But like I said, great scope and the project itself are correct. And I'll update this all this. Uh, and the next time I remind you uh, in these slides, uh, midterm is still having some grading challenges. Uh, Looking at it this way, the reason I haven't released it yet is because um, when they were grading, uh, when people were grading it, grading it, they didn't give partial credit for one of the questions, and I asked them to review it and give partial credit for that question. So it should help some of you. So look at it as a positive that the grades might go up. Uh, they are almost done, um, and I think it was just cross wires that uh, that didn't get updated already. All right, but moving on to p value. Okay, so one of the, this is kind of one of the most important components of this class is the p value. So we're going to touch on it again uh, in kind of a different way. Hopefully, it will help clarify it. But this is just the definition again. Okay, you should have seen this slide before. Um, the p value is the chance if the null hypothesis is true that the test is if it is equal to the value that was observed in the data, or is even further in the direction of the alternative. So basically, this is how how you know whether um, you know you, your null hypothesis is correct or your alternative hypothesis is correct. So put another way, um, the p value tells you how often you would expect to see a test statistic at an extreme or more extreme than the one calculated by your statistical test. Um, if the null hypothesis of that test is true, the p value gets smaller as the test statistic calculated from the data gets further away from the range of test statistics. Written by the null hypothesis. So it's very long winded, um, but I think it's it's kind of clear, or I thought it was clear. So hopefully it helps you as well. But we're also going to have pictures. All right. So when we're trying to get to this, right, what we do is we set up the experiment, we first figure out what our null hypothesis is. And remember, the null hypothesis is something we can test, which is often not what we expect to be true. Okay, so the null hypothesis, whatever your gut instinct says, it's the thing that you can actually test, um, whereas the alternative is the opposite, and usually the opposite you can't test. Okay, not always, but usually. Um, and then what value does P mean the alternative hypothesis is true? That's what you set that key cutoff beforehand to say, okay, if it's in you know this range, then we're going to say it's the alternative, or it's going to be, if it's not in that range, then it's the uh, uh, null hypothesis. All right, so here's my picture. So imagine that this is our like number line of where the there our results are going to land, right? So the first thing I do is I do one of my test simulations, right? So I get a value like this, right? That's kind of whatever that would be, like n plus two and a half or something, right? And then I do another one, and then I do another one, and then I do another one, and I do another one, and they're just kind of landing all over the place, right? Uh, don't mind the the y axis, I'm just so you can see it. Um, but then I do a whole lot of tests, right? And what I could see, right, is I'm expecting them to kind of cluster in one rough area, okay? And that area is sometimes an all hypothesis, but sometimes it'll be on the outer edges and be the alternative hypothesis. So what we kind of imagine here is that 
that, that center region in by the prior example was that the null hypothesis was true, right? So if they all land within that null, then the, the null is true. However, if you notice that these overlap a little bit, right? That's basically your P cutoff, okay? Is where is how big that overlap is. And so if it lands in the alternative in the overlap here area, then it's the alternative, not the null. And maybe I should have put the alternatives on top rather than underneath, but that's the idea. And then if you think about it in this, when I was showing that uh, distribution before, it's the, kind of the same idea, right? And so you see this dot here, okay? So that's just into the null. I can't remember what the actual results are for this particular experiment, but this is just into the null. If it was a little bit over here, if it was right here, we would consider that part of the alternative, even though it's technically in the null, right? Because we want to account for that randomness. So that, that line at the edges is a little squishy. All right, does that make sense? Like I said, this is a very important thing to understand. Um, and so basically, if the P is less than our P cutoff, then the alternative hypothesis is true, and it is greater than the null hypothesis is true. And so basically, what we're trying to do is figure out when we, if we run another experiment, where is the result likely to land? Okay. And so that's how we do this kind of prediction or this kind of modeling uh, to figure out answers to questions based on data. Um, and so sometimes we have good data and we can actually do like observation uh, and do the calculations. Sometimes we need to manufacture it. Sometimes we have a decent amount of data and we'll do like shuffling labels or we'll have a small amount of data and we'll use something more like bootstrapping. Um, but there is, these are all techniques to essentially get to the same goal, which is trying to figure out if I run it again or I observe it again, where is it likely to land? All right. So one of the things to think about here is that that, you know, it's a histogram, right? So if you calculate the areas of parts of the histogram, you can actually figure out how many elements are in there. And so if you think about the P area here, um, you know, it's like this whole range, right? And there might be outliers over here that we can't see, but the idea is that one of the things that, to remember is that you're talking about an area on the graph. And so this is just kind of tying it back into some of the earlier terminology, which is that it's statistically significant for, uh, sorry, through what's loop. Um, Either it's statistically significant or highly statistically significant, depending on how big your P cutoff is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the poll is up. Let's go for the number. Uh, how about. Oh, it's changing. Um, I don't remember changing the number. Uh, so how about eight? Right. You don't see uh, powers of two. Okay, 10 or not powers of two, sorry, multiples of two. All right, so confidence intervals for testing. This is kind of pretty straightforward. Um, but so if we want to do a hypothesis test, but we can't submit it under the null, um, so we kind of reverse it, right? So the population average is equal to X, population average is not equal to X, um, and then we set our key value. So this is kind of an example of, you know, it's still kind of arbitrary, but an example in detail. So this is very loud today. Um, if X is not in the interval, we reject the null. And if X is in the interval, we can't reject the null. So that's kind of a more formalized way of saying we took the alternative. Okay. So we, oh, I'm sorry, we rejected the alternative. Uh, so we can either accept the null or we can reject the null. All right. So the next thing we're going to get into is this center and spread idea. Um, so if we look at those histograms, right, um, and we think about where the center of that histogram is, um, that's a, kind of an important way we can start to measure things, particularly when we talk about bell curves, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but the center of that, okay, is basically it's usually the average is the center, and then you have the spread. So obviously, the the smaller kind of width wise that the histogram is the tighter your results are, right? And the spread is how far out they are, okay? Um, it's not this, quite the same spread as from betting, 
Um, but it's the, you know, it's this, it helps for allergies. So it's kind of early. Um, yeah. All right. So we've talked about averages before, um, but just kind of the, the formal definition. So we have, um, you know, we just have two different words for the same thing, average and mean. Um, and the big difference here between this and the median, right, is that the number doesn't have to appear in the set. Okay. So it can just be an arbitrary number that's in the middle. Um, and when we say in the middle, right, it's not necessarily really in the middle, right? It's actually could be skewed one way or the other, but it's in the middle of the data, right? Because sometimes you end up with big outliers that hold, that skew your average. All right. And what I wanted to point out here is just uh, from the function perspective that we use, we have NP mean, we have NP average. Uh, the only difference is that with MD average, you can actually use weights as well. So this would be what you would use if you want to calculate, say, a gradient class, right? Because you don't actually average your, your scores. You say, and I don't remember what the numbers are, but you say the midterm is 15%, the homeworks are you know, 22%, et cetera. Um, and so you have to put in weights uh, to get your actual grade. You can't just average up all your scores. All right, so... Uh, sorry, that's a little cut off. Um, but what I, the next thing I want to kind of show up is that with the histogram, you can actually approximate the mean. Okay, and by and the reason I say approximate is because usually you don't have tick marks that are completely precise. So as a result, it's probably an approximation. If you have really good tick marks, you can get it exactly right. But to calculate the average, you can get you take basically the center, okay, of the of the uh, bar, basically, of the bin, um, and then you multiply it by the height of the bin, okay? So this is 0.5 right here in the middle, and then it's about 11 tall, and then the next one is 1.5, and it's about 23 tall, etc. okay? So you take all those, and you, you add all those multiplications together, then you take just the heights and add all those together, then you do a division, and now you have the mean. Okay. Because what you're doing essentially is calculating all the elements in the in the histogram, right? That makes sense. You can also do something similar. You get the median, okay? And so with the median, all you do is kind of add up all the heights, okay? But then divide that by two. And then it's not necessarily going to give you kind of the, the median per se, it's going to give you what bucket it's in. Okay, so it's in, in three. Okay, that it's like a position. Right, because obviously the media still has to appear in the set. So we don't know that 51 appears in the set. We just know that 51 appeared in the third bucket. Okay. Sorry. Not the 51 appears in the third bucket. 51 indicates that the median is in the third bucket. All right. So when we're so the mean and the median are uh, really useful because they kind of show you skew, right? Uh, if they're really close together, there's very little skew. If they're uh, far apart, there's skew. And depending on which direction they're far apart, like if the median is higher or lower than the mean, it indicates which way your histogram is going to be skewed. So basically, it's kind of a quick and dirty way to figure out what the histogram is going to look like if you don't want to calculate the histogram itself. All right. So the reason we're talking about all this is because we want to get to standard deviation. Um, and so if we look at the kind of base value and the small value, right, as it says here, um, it doesn't tell us much about that shape of the distribution. And that's a lot of the time what we care about is like how, with, like, that's why we're looking at it as distribution, is we want to know what is the shape of it. You know, is it a bell or is it skewed or whatever, because that tells us something about the data. So a better way to look at it might be to measure the variability around the mean, and how do we do that? So we need to quantify that. So, <clears throat> all 
First thing we're going to do is just create, create a table with some arbitrary values um, that are not very big, just to show you the example. Um, and what we can do is that we first are going to just take the average of the data that we have, and then we're going to look at those deviations. Okay. And so how far away is each of the values in the data set of far or how far away are they from the average? Right. And then if you notice, if we add up all those deviations, it should come out to zero. All right, so get to the right window. <laughs> So in order to calculate the standard deviation, we are going to um, square the deviation first, right? Yeah. So, not So deviations. So now we have another table now with all the deviations squared. And, and again, what we're trying to do is smooth it out, right? Or we're trying to get um, something that's a little easier to, to evaluate. So we're going to square it primarily to kind of push, separate it out a little bit more, make it a little more obvious where the, like, how pronounced the deviations are, as well as to get rid of those negatives. All right, and then we can do what's called the variance. Let me just make sure I remember this code. And so we pull off the variance, and so that's the average, basically, of that uh, the square deviations. Okay, and so the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So we do that with just 0.5, and so 2.7 or 2.8 is the standard deviation. We're going to talk about why that's interesting, but basically, it's like how far away. The various values are from the average. And so that's how you would calculate it. However, there's an easier way because obviously standard deviation gets used a lot. You've probably all heard of it before. So you can actually just use the FPD uh, method, which is short for standard deviation, pretty commonly short for standard deviation. Um, and you obviously get the same hint, right? So, and this is where we kind of got messed up a little bit last time. Well, not quite, but in a second. Um, it, it turned out, I figured out why the slides really didn't make any sense. It's because I had actually grabbed uh, this coming Thursday's lecture, not this one. So it assumed the knowledge from this one. That's why I was really super confused um, when I was trying to fill the rest of our time. But so here's just the kind of the standard deviation. Um, and one of these things, this is one of those things where, again, you just kind of remember that when you say it, you kind of do it backwards. Okay. So we call it what the root mean square. Okay. So we're going to take, we're going to average the data, then we're going to determine the deviation of the data from the mean, square the deviations, take the mean of the square to get the variance, and then take the square root of the mean, and that's our standard deviation. Uh, so in kind of short, right, we take the data, average it, find the deviation, square, mean, square root. Okay, and so, but it's called a root mean square or square root mean square um, because you kind of, you tend to say the things backwards when you talk about it, right? Think about when you do subtraction, right? You say, I'm going to take, you know, uh, nine from 10, um, and, but you kind of mean it in reverse when you actually write it out, okay. right? And I write this one. It's also known as the quadratic mean, uh, we'll usually use R and S. All right. So, yay, right? Um, but it's actually kind of interesting, and this is what we were talking about last time. Shevchenko uh, did a really interesting proof, um, and so we can figure out what the distribution looks like based on the standard deviation. Um, you can read those very hard sentences. Uh, two quick comments. Uh, I tend to use uh, a lot of programming. Uh, like kind of constructs in my writing. So equal equals means they're equal to each other, right? First in the assignment. Um, and then you've all probably seen plus or minus. Um, it just means, you know, on either side. All right, so here's that inequality. 
Um, and it proves the thing that no matter what the shape of the distribution, the proportion of values in the range mean plus or minus some number of standard deviations is at least one minus one divided by the square amount of the of your number of deviations. So um, for example, the mean if the mean is 10 and the standard deviations are three. Um, then at least how many of the values are within uh, four to 16? And so we can calculate this um, and yeah, let's give it a try. All right, so you either do it in your own book uh, or take a wild guess, um, but raise your right hand if you think the answer is 89% and raise your left hand if you think the answer is 92%. Make sure I don't get the wrong answer because sometimes I need to see. All right, Shane, uh, come on, pick one. Either calculated or guessed. Um, right hand is 89, left hand is 92. All right, so eh, the right hand's had it. So, but what it really means is we can get to this nice table. <laughs> That's really handy. And this would be something that I would think about uh, memorizing. Um, so basically, if you want to know where 75% of the data is, you know it's within the average plus or minus two standard deviations. So one of the things that I, mean, I find confusing about this is that when I say plus or minus two standard deviations, how many standard deviations is that? Four. How many? Right, it's four, right? Because it's two on one side and two on the other. Um, but what's really cool is that no matter what the distribution looks like, this will be true. Okay, so it doesn't have to be about her, it can be any distribution. All right. Then we have a little demo. Uh, so first we're gonna grab, grab the, the baby weights. Um, and we're going to get rid of whether or not there are tokers. Um, and then we're going to do a histogram of just uh, the just the stational days. Um, oh, sorry. No, we're actually going to do I why I put that comment there. Um, so we're actually, if, if you notice, and you may have done this possibly by accident before, but if I just say call histogram and give it bin sizes, it will, or not give it bin sizes. Um, and don't tell it to overlay, I can actually get a histogram for all the columns in the table. Okay. So if you're usually this is something when you're like exploring the data that's useful, not usually something when you're presenting the data. It's more like, oh, I want to see them all once because I want to know where I want to look. Usually things like overlays and that kind of stuff are more useful. Um, but as you can see, we have a bunch of different distributions, but we're going to look at this maternal pregnancy weight. Um, one in particular, um, mostly because I want to show an example that is like that's pretty skewed, right? Um, so that's why it's kind of interesting. All right, so the first thing I do is pull out uh, just the average and the standard deviation size. So we know that the average is um, uh, 128 pounds uh, and that the standard de uh, deviation is 20 pounds. So that's where the Chebyshev uh, calc really kind of comes into handy, right? So, let's see. Okay, so this is just kind of show, like pulling out kind of one segment of it to say, okay, show me all of the birth weights that are within uh, three standard deviations of both sides. Um, and we know from this prior slide that that should be 88% or 89% of our population, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, so let's see what it does. Okay, well, it's 98%, right? But what does this say? This says at least, okay? So it's just gonna be more than 89%, um, but it won't be below that. All right, and so it should be just do the calculation. So it should be 
um, because we just did we replaced our z there with the actual value, uh, and now we can just do that. And we know that it should be right around, you know, or it should be at least eighty nine percent of parameter. All right. So that's all the table columns, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use I don't know if you've used labels in the labs or homework yet, uh, probably. But basically, it's just kind of grab all the column names, which, if you'll recall, uh, you normally have to type in manually. So here we have kind of a more advanced loop where I'm going to take all those labels and then generate data or generate kind of output based on each column. So I can then run that. And so you can see that for each of these, the birth weight, for example, 95% or so is. Um, percent of the data is, is within two standard deviations, which is greater than junction, right? So basically you can kind of, this is improving it, but you can get a better feel for how does this work and the, is it true? And the other reason is I wanted to give you an example of a for loop that does something a little more interesting uh, or a little more complex. So you can kind of pull out all that data and actually calculate it. So theoretically, they should all be over. Uh, most likely, if they're not, it's because I have a bug uh, rather than uh, a mathematician being wrong. All right. So the next thing we talk about is, OK, so now we talked about those standard deviations being a certain distance away. Well, the next thing we want to do is we want to be able to compare our apples to apples. OK, so when we were talking, I talked kind of quickly about the final exam versus the mentor exam. You can't compare those distributions without setting them to some sort of standard unit because one might be you know out of 90 points and one might be out of 22 points, right? So we can't compare them very well. So what we want to do is shift them into a standard unit so that we can compare the two things um, because we want to know on average, right? Uh, you know, are the students kind of progressing? Like, because what you hope, right, is that in the final exam they're going to be better than they did in midterm, maybe. Um, so what we do to do that is we convert the thing to what are called standard units, okay? And that is a like a formal term, even though it seems really obvious as the name of, of what we've been talking about. Um, so the way we do that, though, and this is why we have to talk about standard deviation first, is that we take the value minus the average divided by the standard deviation. Um, and that way we'll shift kind of everything to be right around zero. So the average is going to shift to zero on a graph and you know one standard deviation will be at one, right? And so 96% of our values are gonna be between minus five and five once we move it to standard units because of the same, oops, because of this, right? So it's just that we shifted the whole data set, you know, either the left or the right or whatever, to make it so they're all right around zero. All right, so I'm going to show an example of that, I believe. And so we just calculate the standard units. Um, and this is where I'm going to ask the crowd how to calculate the standard units. So what should I put in here to get um, a method that will calculate standard units? I'll even go back. This for a minute. And yeah, and just you know, note that X is an array. Okay, so it's a it's the whole set of data. Yeah, it is. Be something like value minus average divided by np stdx. Yes, I think so. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to listen. Um, so x minus the average. Um, we're shooting mean because it's shorter. Um, and then divided by those. Don't be the place. Uh, and then divided by the standard deviation. Right, so now I have a handy little function that can convert an array to standard units. Um, and I go back to my 
ages here, we can take the emer maternal ages and let's convert that to standard units. We can use our new little function. And so now our, our whole array is going to be wrapped around here. Um, and we can kind of pull out what do we expect it to look like. Okay, so um, when we shift it, right, so the, the average All right, let me look at this one. Um, okay, so basically what I can do is, uh, you know, I can kind of put them on the same table together and I can kind of see how they're shifting uh, if you, you know, were kind of interested. So we kind of can guess, right, that the average is going to be somewhere in the middle between like 23 and 28, right? Because the 23 is going to be below zero and the 28 is going to be above zero. Um, so it's just kind of showing you how far away it is. Which and what we expect. Let's we'll see if I can. So this is just the histogram. Oh, let me see if I can put this to render. So as you can see now, the we shifted it to be around zero, so that now we can compare. Say the ages to the maternal weights, and we can compare those distributions. You know, but like maybe the definition is, you know, do uh, women who have children later in life tend to weigh more or less? Right. Those are two things that we can't really compare very easily without shifting them to something like standard units, so that we can, uh, like I said, apples to apples. Okay. So this is just in standard units, um, and yeah. So pretty straightforward. We're really kind of building up to a real tool chain. Um, and so in order to do that, we need standard units, we need standard deviation, et cetera. So um, one of the things that is kind of from an eyeball perspective, a lot of data in the natural world, right, tends to be bell-shaped. You've probably heard this before. Um, you know, grades generally should be bell-shaped. Um, otherwise, there might be a problem with the, the, the grading mechanism or the exam, say. Um, so, but what you can do is that you can actually eyeball standard deviation by looking at the bell curve. So, if you see the bell curve, um, the average is at the center, right? And then uh, the point of inflection, and I'll show you another slide, which will be clearer, that's where the first standard deviation is on either side. So, if you look here, where I kind of try to draw it in, but basically it's where the curve starts to change types. So like when you're going from kind of the one curve to the other, that's where that standard deviation is. And so we can kind of say, okay, the average is, you know, in the middle, and then that's one standard deviation and one over here. Okay. And you can eyeball it by kind of looking at where it goes from like this kind of curve to this kind of curve. Right. But you can also obviously calculate it. All right, so we're going to pull up just another histogram, except we're setting the bins to make uh, what I'm trying to show a little more obvious. Um, and it's pretty close to a bell curve. So we know that the mean is uh, going to be 60, about 64, and the standard deviation is about 2.5. And we can estimate that if we look at this picture, right? So we can say, okay, yeah, that looks like about the middle, right? And then here's, you know, if we imagine there's a curve there. Yeah, I can see why I would think, or why you know, I would have guessed that standard deviation would be two and a half less than 64. Okay, so that would be whatever, 61 and a half. So that would be about, I don't know, here ish, right? And that seems like about where that inflection point is on that curve. And then uh, this just calculates the actual uh, distance in the standard deviation. All right, so uh, basically now we know from our earlier graph, right, that we have a good chunk of them within one steep deviation, 75%, two standard deviations, sorry. Oops. All right, so what we're going to do now, though, is that because if we have a normal distribution, okay, so um, one of the common terms for this is a bell curve, probably the one you've heard a million times. 
but it's actually called the normal distribution. Okay. So that's the standard normal curve um, and normal proportions, no matter what the shape of the distribution, the bulk of the data are in the range, the average, plus or minus a few standard deviations. But if the if the histogram is bell-shaped, then we get to go even further and we can say almost all of the data are in the range of average plus or minus three standard deviations. Right. And so we can actually get even better than Shevichev that it works on all distributions, but if we have a normal distribution, then we can actually say, okay, within one standard deviation, we have about 68%, two, we have 95%, and three, 99.7%. Okay, and those are also useful data values. Um, and so if we can show that it's a normal distribution, that tells us even more about that data set, uh, kind of from just the fact that it's a normal distribution. All right, so kind of tying it back to um, the uh, center and spread, uh, we also call this the central area. Okay, so two standard deviations, which from the prior slide we'll say is 95% of the data. Okay, looks like this. So, what does that mean uh, in terms of the stuff we've been doing? Well, here's that our P cutoff there is at about negative two, right, and positive two. Because that's two and a half percent left, because we know that the yellow area is 95 percent. So we have five percent left, and that could be our cut. Okay. Wow. I am wildly off on estimating uh, lecture speed today, or this week, or the last two days. Um, Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the central limit here because it should be in. Okay, so if we talk about the central limit theorem, so that that central area that describes how the normal distribution of the state curve is connected to random sample averages. And we care about sample averages because they estimate population averages. So, what does that mean? So, if the sample is large and drawn at random with replacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability distribution of the sample average or sum is roughly the normal distribution. So, that's excuse me. Um, so basically, what this is kind of saying with math behind it, okay, is that if you can look at a large population, you can actually get uh, good estimates when you uh, draw at random from it uh, to you know make some sort of estimate about that data set, uh, which I think we've talked about and we know a little bit, but this is kind of the the real version. So. Um, So if we look at kind of the data, I don't know, let, me, let me do the demo first. Maybe. Oops. Oh. 
So hopefully this is all independent in the work. All right. So if we look at the simple limit theorem, so we're going to load that united air uh, air uh, plate plate delays uh, data, uh, which you've seen before. Um, and the first thing we do is we're going to look at the number of rows because what we want to do is think about how can we sample out of it. So um, what if the population is equal to seven and the sample size is equal to two? Okay, then we'll get forty nine versions of it, or possibly, right? So with our current one, and we want to do, we did the samples of that whole population. Uh, let's say we want to do 100, right? That's a very large number of combinations, okay? So that's going to be too many to do work with, right? So what about if we wanted to get something realistic, right? So that's with 400, and then it just kind of keeps going up from there and gets really bad. So if we look at this histogram, um, I just showed it to you a second ago. So the histogram of the flight delays, we get a long tail out there, but we know that the mean is very skewed, right? But the standard deviation is also kind of like skewed as a result because it ends up being like 40 out here, right? So that's one standard deviation because the, the tail here is so long. Uh, so we end up with these, with these kind of data that is kind of difficult to work with because it's so skewed. So instead, maybe we look at the median and we see that the median is actually two. And so what we can do then is we'll take a sample mean, okay, and try to make this work such that we don't have to do as much work as going all the way back here. So we're going to use the central limit theorem by basically making uh, or taking a smaller number of examples. Oops, very fast. Okay. Oh, there we go. We didn't actually call it. Um, okay, so if I get 10,000 sample means, okay, and I pull out, oh, I'm sorry, wait. No, right. So, sorry, I, I always say this. I, I want to try to say this very carefully. I'm going to, for 100 sample means, I'm going to go and run 10,000 iterations of samples. Okay, so I'm going to do 100 sets of 1,000 to find out what those means are. And we're going to get really big from there. And as it says, it's very slow. So what we're going to we're going to find right is that we don't want to do this. It's too big, right? Like this takes a long. I don't have the kind of patience. Okay, and imagine if it was a real data set that was much much bigger. It's going to be much harder. So we're going to find some tricks to get better. Uh, someday when this finishes up. Okay, so we end up with some nice histograms though, where we're starting to get to that average delay and having a more useful data. But if you notice, right, what we want is we want to think about the, that center and spread. So this is really far apart, right? It goes from like five to 30. Um, and but this goes 12 to 22, and then this goes, I don't know, 12 to 20. So it's starting to get tighter. So basically what we're showing here is that central limit theorem says, if we keep making bigger samples, right, we'll actually get closer to the right answer. And I can overlay, I think this overlays them. Yeah. Um, and so you can see, right, kind of very visually that pulling bigger samples is a much better choice, okay? So remember, what we're doing is we're saying actually it's the same size sample each time, but how many times we go through the sample and then we run the average on it, uh, and then we end up with a history that looks like this. So we do it 900 times, it's going to come out much better than if we do it 100 times. Um, and in future lecture, maybe next lecture, maybe the one after that, we'll talk about like how do we figure out what that number is, right? Because what is big, right? So kind of going back here, up there. Here, um, we can look at our original data set, right? So imagine we don't actually have this, but if we do the mean of the 900 flight delays, we're starting to get closer, right, to what the actual mean is of our real population by doing this work. 
So the problem is right now it's still using a lot of data or a lot of time, uh, but the central limit theorem lets us do this in a way and we can kind of prove that it will, that the average is in there somewhere. Okay, and the and the center and spread component of it is like how wide it is is how accurate we are, right? Because if it's really wide, obviously then the average could be anywhere in that width. The narrower it is, the better. And I apparently jumped the gun on the slide. Um, and so if we imagine all possible random samples of the same size of yours, there are lots of them, but each of these samples has an average. And the distribution of the sample average is the distribution of the averages of all the possible things. So, what this kind of tells us is that it, it helps us approximate, right? It helps us get close to that average. And the more, the bigger, the bigger the um, the set of samples that we take is, uh, or a bigger of sets of samples that we take is, the closer we will be to the actual result. And so that's kind of the central limit theorem. Um, and we're going to kind of leverage that to try to do uh, some of our future work. All right. But I think we can pause this off there. So that's a good thing to listen to. Yeah, we'll stop there. I know it's early, but hey, um, it's good at two. So I want to go with your progression. Uh, any questions about that? All right, let me just jump back to project two. Just uh, it should be there in materials already. Um, and basically, you can work on it as groups. Okay, the groups, the rules are kind of in the in the project two description, but in short, it's you can work with your group from your lab or from this type of thing. So, question. What was the attendance code for today? I don't remember. Eight, eight. I usually rely on the fact that almost everybody gets it right. And so 